um, I challenge you to a game of rock, paper, scissors. Get ready. You're on, Marisa. Okay. Um, we're going to do one, two, three, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay? All right. All right. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh, look at that. Three rocks. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? <laughs> Gosh. Must uh, have rocks on the brain. <laughs> yeah, speaking of rocks. Uh, so that's what we're here to talk about today. My name is Marisa. I'm the public programs manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History and uh, joined again as I am every week by Gavin Graham, the geology gents. Hello. Hello. Hey, Marisa. Hey. Um, so what are we going to be discussing today? Well, we are going to discuss a guide to identifying rocks. And so I'll share my screen here. All right. And also, yeah, for everyone watching at home, um, as we go through this, we're going to jump right in, but if you have any uh, comments or questions, feel free to put them uh, in the comments. And we, we have a comment already that someone's curious about your backdrops today, <laughs> so this is well, a good segue. <laughs> well, I think that as I share my screen here, you will understand where we're going with this. So today we're presenting the first part in a, a few part series of the Gents Guide to Identifying Rocks. And today is the curious case of the three rock types. And so here the Gents will take you on some sleuth work to figure out, to identify three rocks. And so with that, I'll show you, oh, I'll show you the three rocks. So the Gents have, have been brought to the attention that there are these three mysterious rocks there out there. And we're, we're gonna need to figure out what these rocks are. We're gonna need to identify these rocks. And so, we're gonna ask the audience for help today identifying these rocks. And so right off the bat here, we have rock one, two, and three. So if anybody out there has any idea of what these might be, any identifying patterns or features of these that they wanna put in the comments, that might be helpful once we get to the end of this talk to try to figure out what these rocks are. And so right. Grant, and it's a great opportunity to just practice our observations. You know, we've got our 221Bs up behind us and we're trying to channel all the deductive reasoning that we can from, from Holmes and Watson. And so, you know, we want to start by, um, you know, we'll give you the things you need to know to zoom in and figure these out, but just starting, you know, get ourselves warmed up with, with these observations. That sounds great. And so Graham, when we're trying to identify a rock, what's the first step that we take? Ooh, that's really important. So there's so many different kinds of rock out there, but they all fit into one of three groups. And that's the that's this great sort of overarching structure that allows us to, you know, to, to really get to the bottom of, of what sort of rock we, we might have. That sounds great, Graham. And so we have here the three main rock types. And a lot of times, and I know that we have talked about these several times on, on this sort of podcast already, but we, and we don't want to belabor the audience too much with the three main rock types, but in terms of identifying rocks, first off, getting to identify whether they're igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic is a really good start. So I say we just dive in and go through the three of them once, once again, because there's nothing like repetition to seal it in the memory. And not only are we going to talk about the way that they form, but we're also going to talk about how we can recognize them, right? So an igneous rock, we know that that forms from molten rock. It, if it's lava above the ground or if it's magma deep underground, the rock is melted down. It's a liquid. And so as this rock cools, it's going to freeze. It's going to freeze just like when you put water in the refrigerator, in the freezer, and it freezes into ice. And as it freezes, it hardens and it forms crystals. And so just like this quartz crystal, uh, you know, an igneous rock like a granite, for instance, is going to have these crystals that are forming out of that liquid as it hardens and freezes. And those crystals are going to interlock with one another. So this is the key thing for an igneous rock. It's got interlocking crystals or a crystalline structure. So in those two images off to the side, um, we've got all these different types of big crystals that are locking into one another. Sometimes those crystals are really small if it, if it cooled really quick. I'm not going to go into the details of that here. We'll save that, I think, for next week. 
But sometimes if we're really lucky, and this is especially true for things like lava flows, we can actually see textures in the rock that show that it was flowing at one point. But I don't think we've got any textures like that in the rocks we're identifying today. So that can be very useful, but I don't think, I don't know if we'll have a chance to exercise that yet. That's so, right. And so, sorry, sorry. Oh, no, to, please go ahead, Gavin. I just have a question. Also, what about the crystal shapes? Can they often be an identifier? Oh, they can, because since they're forming out of a liquid, they've got plenty of room to grow. And crystals like to grow in certain ways, just like that quartz crystal is growing out in that long shape. And so if crystals are given the opportunity to just sort of relax and stretch out how they like to, they're going to form in their own distinctive shapes. Uh, we call that crystal habit or uh, crystal shape is just a simple way to refer to it. Um, and so we should be able to recognize that um, based on the types of minerals that are in that rock. That's but right. sometimes these rocks get crunched up, right? And they're not, they're, not, they're not an igneous rock anymore. What happens to them, Gavin? Oh, fantastic question, Graham. So that brings us to the second rock type, my personal favorite, the sedimentary rocks. And so as Graham mentioned, sedimentary rocks are formed when you take one of the other type, two types of rocks or both, and you crush them up, you deposit them somewhere in the earth, and over time, they solidify and form rocks. So you start off with sediments, and then you get rocks over time. And so that leads me to the identifying features. And the first one is visible sediments. So as you may imagine, if you start off with sediments like the ones here, or some that you would find in a beach or a river, for, for, for instance, you, and you make a rock out of those, you might be able to see them within the rock. You can, as you scratch the surface of the rock, you can sort of start pulling them off and you can feel the sand grains or the small grains in your hands sometimes. So the first identifying feature, visible sediments, is usually a dead ringer. Now, similarly to igneous rocks, and all I would say for all rocks in general, really the idea and the best identifying features are the ones that are a function of how they are formed. And so, as I mentioned, sedimentary rocks are formed by crushing up other rocks and depositing them out in the earth or on top of the earth. And oftentimes when they're deposited, they're done in horizontal layers, and we call this bedding. People might be familiar with bedding if they were to look up pictures or are lucky enough to visit the Grand Canyon. So bedding can be on large scales, but it, all, it can also be on small scales, the hand sample scale even. So here's a picture up in the top right here of a, a hand sample. It's a beach sample from Santa Cruz and you can see all of these tiny layers in it. And so these layers are really uniform and they're often a dead ringer for a sedimentary rock because they they uh, represent how those layers were deposited. And then the third feature I have here is depositional textures. So that's sort of a different, a different thing, but related. So if oftentimes sediments are deposited in um, water rich environments and the, the energy, the amount of flow in those waters can oftentimes impart textures on these rocks that are dead ringers for sedimentary rocks and good identifying features. So down here in the bottom left, I have these, this uh, sedimentary rock on the bottom, it has sort of uh, flat lying layers. In the middle, it has these angular layers. Those are called cross beds. And those are something we might look for um, if, and might look for and know that it's a sedimentary rock based on those. But again, I didn't see any of those necessarily in the rocks that we were looking at, but something to look for nonetheless. So Gavin, I've got one more question for you while we're, while we're looking at these sedimentary rocks. Remember when we were looking at some of those igneous rocks up above, we had all those big crystals that were around one another. What about this, uh, this one down in the bottom corner? That looks kind of chunky. That looks like it's got some, some big grains in there. Why isn't that an igneous rock? Ah, fantastic question, Graham. I'm glad you asked it. So this is a rock that geologists like to call a conglomerate. And you're right, you do see these sort of big pieces of rock and they might look at like crystals to begin or at, at first glance, but what you see is in between each of these little pieces, each of these sort of round pieces is a brown stuff. That brown stuff is what we call a matrix. You'll probably have heard me talk about that if you tuned in last week. 
And that matrix is made up of really tiny sediments. And so what this is, is uh, a bunch of sediments that are sort of pebble size and they're rounded and within a matrix of other sediments. So they're not interlocking crystals like in the igneous rock. They're actually larger sediments and a smaller sediment matrix. And one sort of giveaway that I would look for for in a, in a conglomerate like this is that those sediments are rounded. So oftentimes you see, if you go to a river and you see sort of tumbled rocks, they'll be rounded. So rounded sediments are a good giveaway for sedimentary rocks. Okay, that helps a lot. I'm glad. Okay, Graham. So we've gone through igneous, we've gone through sedimentary. To me, those are the most straightforward, but there's a third type and it always trips me up. It's sort of enigmatic. Do you want to take us through I'd love to, because as mysterious as they are, the metamorphic rocks are, are just truly a delightful category of rocks. I just, I love them so much. Um, so metamorphic rocks are, they're in some ways like igneous rocks and in some ways more like sedimentary rocks. Metamorphic rocks are, you get those when you take some piece of rock, it could be any of the three rock types, and then you heat it or you squeeze it or you pump a lot of water through it and that changes it. And so what, it, it, what, what changes is that a metamorphic rock becomes recrystallized or it forms new minerals. So it has a, it is a crystalline rock. So we talked about igneous rocks. Those are made of, of crystalline minerals. Sedimentary rocks, we call those clastic because they've got pieces that are sort of held together. But then metamorphic rocks are crystalline again. They've got you know, their own crystals that have regrown in there. Um, and, but they never melted. And that's a really important point. Once you melt, you go back to being an igneous rock. Um, but these metamorphic rocks never melt, they just recrystallize. So it's a chemical change. And you can really see that in these top two uh, images here that are showing off foliation. So oftentimes as they're getting changed chemically, um, there's heat and then they're also getting squeezed. And that squeezing on them, the minerals want to sort of arrange themselves so that they're, they're not taking up too much space. And so they'll often go into these lines that look kind of like bedding, but we call it foliation. Um, this foliation is the a rock sort of arranges itself into sheets. Uh, and so you can see in that one in the middle that you've got these sort of lighter uh, layers of quartzy material and feldspar material. And then you've got these darker layers of biotite don't worry too much about those, those minerals. We can learn more about them at another time. And then in that picture next to it, we're actually looking down at one of those sheets. That's the a mica mineral, uh, probably muscovite, maybe a little biotite in there. Um, it's probably mostly biotite, um, but that's giving it that golden sheen. And you can sort of see how those, those layers are undulating across there. And that also comes from, you know, they get squeezed and, and squashed and that gives a little texture to it. Sometimes these will even get hot enough that they get close to melting. So they don't melt, but they get gooey. They start acting like silly putty, or if you've got a jar of caramel because you're whipping up a hot fudge sundae and it starts cold coming out of the refrigerator, but then as you heat it up, it gets gooier and gooier. Same things happen to rocks. Um, and so in that, that one with those wiggling dark and light um, bands, that's the foliation actually getting sort of gooey and, and oozing about there. We call that a migmatite. And so sometimes we see those high temperature, um, you know, hallmarks. And then something that metamorphic rocks, you know, in a way they almost get how tricky they are. So they give us something to help us out. Um, those are metamorphic minerals. You know, they're really key special minerals that you own that only really show up in metamorphic rocks. So that green one there, that sort of bladey, flaky green one, that's a classic mineral. We've talked about it before. We love, um, you know, finding it all over the place here in California. That's serpentine. That is the, the mineral that makes up serpentinite. Um, and that is, you know, that forms deep underground where you've got ocean crust and it's getting a bunch of hot water moving through it, that's changing it. And then another great mineral is garnet. It's that, that sort of soccer ball looking ruby colored mineral down there. And garnets only form at really high pressures. So you need to be deep underground in a classic metamorphic setting to form those. And once you find garnet in a rock, you know that that's gotta be metamorphic or there's something real funky going on there.
Oh, that was a great description, Graham. Oh, thank I, you, I feel so much better about metamorphic rocks <laughs> after hearing that. And so now we've, we've gone through sort of the, the ideas that we think about when we look at a rock and we try to figure out if it's one of these three. And so what do you say we go back to sleuthing and we try to figure out the three mysterious rocks we started off at? That sounds great. All right, so let's, let's, let's try and crack the case of, of rock number one. Sounds great. Okay, so let's look, let's look at it further. And so rock number one would be the classic nondescript rock. Oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, it's a gray rock. And so that's, that's a tough starting place. And so let's, let's look at it closer, Graham. So on the surface, it looks pretty nondescript. I don't see any of those textures we talked about. So I'm going to do what I like to do best when I look at rocks. I look at them closely. I'll take my magnifying glass out or my hand lens, as we talked about in the toolboxes uh, chat last week, and I'm going to look closer. And so if I look closer at this rock, I have a blown up picture here on the right. Now you can start seeing sort of different textures, some different shapes and colors. And what jumps out to me is this texture that is sort of analogous to where what I have in, have, uh, in this circle here. And I see these sort of little pieces of rocks. You see those, Graham? Oh, I do see those. And so do you think those look crystalline? You know, they just, it, it almost seems like they're stacked up on top of one another, right? None of them are really are, are hooked into one another or fitting together like pieces in a puzzle, are they? No, you're right. They sort of do look like sort of single pieces. They're not fitting together. And you can see that they're almost the size of like a sand grain, right? I would imagine that if I had this rock in my hand, I could almost scratch some of these pieces right off of there, right? Mm -hmm. It would probably feel pretty rough too if you ran your hand over it. Feel almost like right. sandpaper. That's right. So we have no sort of visible interlocking crystals and we have things that look like grains. And so this, this is going to sort of narrow it down, isn't it, Graham? This, I would say that this is a sedimentary rock, right? I would agree with you. And the cool part about sedimentary rocks is that their descriptions are often the rock type. So in this case, we had mentioned grain size. And so grain size is a way we could say, this is probably a sandstone, because you can see these in there. If you had the rock, it might be easier, but you can see these, they look like sand sized grains. So I think we might have cracked this case, huh? This is probably a sandstone, right? I think so. One down, two to go. One down, two to go. Let's jump into number two. What do you see here, Graham? Ooh, I'm seeing, okay, so this one looks a little bit different. This one, you can almost, you know, you don't have to zoom in that much to see what's going on here, which is, you know, I always like an excuse to get closer to a rock, but for this one, we can work with, with it's making it easy for us. That's right. Um, so I see a few different colors here. There's kind of a smoky gray, there's a dark greenish black. There's a kind of milky, creamy white. And they have, you know, sort of consistent shapes. The really dark stuff tends to be a little bit longer. Um, the white stuff tends to be a lot blockier. Um, and it looks like they're, they're kind of hooked into one another. You know, they're, they're filling in the spaces around one another. And they certainly don't seem to be, you know, just stuck together and stacked up on one another like those sand grains did. I might even say these look like they're interlocking. That is a good observation, Graham. You know, the sedimentologist in me is just looking all over the place here for a sediment and I cannot find one. <laughs> these, are, these are crystals, right? These are interlocking. They're, it, it seems like it's one big block of rock fit, filled with sort of interlocking crystals or minerals like we talked about last week, right? So, right. so Graham, do you think it's igneous or metamorphic? Hmm. And this is this can often be a real tricky part because when you know it's often a process of elimination that helps us to say that it's not metamorphic. So we can start by seeing: do we see any foliation? Do we see this like layering of minerals in here because they're trying to fit together in a space? And I would say no. This is you know it looks blocky and chunky and it's it's looks like it just had the space to fill you know as it was crystallizing out so we don't really see a foliation there's no you know hallmark um metamorphic minerals in here 
So I think we can probably safely say that this was an igneous rock. I think you're right, Graham. And you know, something else that popped out at me when I was looking at this rock was that we have sort of very similar shapes for some of these, these minerals, right? We have these long sort of blade-like crystals uh, up here, and then they have geometric sides too. And then for the white stuff, they're sort of big and sort of blocky. I think I even might know what these minerals are, but I won't tell you till next week. That's a, that's a little foreshadowing to what we're going to talk, be talking about next week. But I think that this is an igneous rock also based on the fact that we can see these geometric shapes that look like these minerals we have here on the right. Do you agree? I agree. All right. Rock I think two down. Yeah, rock two down. We could, we, uh, that one's finished. So let's look at rock three. Now this, this rock is sort of an interesting looking one, huh? This is, but I also say that about every rock and I know you do too, Gavin. <laughs> Fair enough. So what do you see here, Graham? Okay, so I see, I see some lines and I know you've drawn some lines on there to help show it, but there's these, you know, it's, it's a little bit grayish and then there's some darker parts that, you know, have these sort of very thin, narrow lines. Would, do you think that that's bedding? Well, you know, I don't really think it looks like bedding because remember back to that sandstone we talked about in the sedimentary part of this, that sandstone had these very uniform flat beds. And I'm not saying that's every sedimentary rock has that, but you really can't distinguish the beds here. They're sort of very subtle. You're right. You They're really down. thin and they even sometimes wiggle a little bit, right? That's right. Yeah. So okay. I don't think it's bedding. But what about, you know, this, this rock kind of has a, a glint to it. What about up here? I boxed this up at the top right. What is this, these sort of sparkles, Graham? Be still my heart, Gavin. Are those crystal faces of none other than a mica mineral? <gasps> I feel like they are. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. So that, that kind of makes me think about foliation like you were talking about. But there's something that pops out to me at, about this rock, and I have it circled. What do you think these sort of chocolate chips in the otherwise batter are, Graham? Oh, those are beautiful garnet crystals. They're, they usually form around you know, 12 sides to them. So we say they're dodecahedral. They look like a soccer ball or a beach ball with all those sides to them. You've got these great big round, you know, with, with these nice clean faces on them. Those have got to be garnets. And once we catch a metamorphic mineral like that, I, I think we've, the, the case is as good as closed. I, I like that, Graham. So a real, a real dead ringer there. So I think that th that's rock three. And I would say that we, we, we solved that. That's metamorphic, huh? That's got to be a metamorphic rock. Oh. We, so, so I think we've done it. We've, we had three mysterious rocks. We've at least started talking about what the rock type is. And so that brings us to part two of this series. Please join us next, next week in the adventure of the igneous rocks to learn how to identify different types of igneous rocks. And sort of, we, we said that this rock was igneous. Now let's try to say what kind of rock it is. And this will, this will bring up, sort of bring together the last two talks that we had. Last week, we talked about um, what, what a rock's made of. This week, we talked about uh, how to identify rocks. We're gonna take what we learned about minerals and try to figure out what types of igneous rocks there are based on their minerals. That sounds pretty good, huh, Graham? That sounds great, Gavin. You know, this week was so fun, but it was also rather elementary, uh -huh. my dear Gavin. And I so like we can there. delve a little deeper into these the specific types of rocks and starting with the adventure of the igneous rocks, I think that'll be a, a great way to explore those minerals. That sounds fantastic. The mystery continues, I love it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, so let's see, maybe we'll uh, pop out of this. Uh, Gavin, you wanna stop sharing? Sure, yeah. um, so thanks for that. Um, we got one question during this that uh, is a little not related to the mystery at hand, but is kind of a, a puzzle, is a mystery. Someone's wondering if you can make a rock. What do you guys can think? Make... Do we have the power? Do humans have the power? So I actually talked about, well, there are some parts of definitions of rocks where some some folks will say that a rock needs to be made on its own. But when you take a tray of water, an ice cube tray, and you put it in a freezer, you're freezing those the, that water. It's forming individual crystals of the mineral ice. 
And those minerals together make an ice cube, which is kind of a, a you know, a person made rock. By definition, it is a rock. So yeah, I like that, Graham. You're right. It, do, it does really kind of depend on your definition of rock. Oftentimes there, it needs to form in a natural environment, but if you can make minerals, which we can, I'm sure that a lot of people at home have had crystal growing kits or have just taken a bunch of salty water and let it evaporate. That's basically making minerals. If you can do that and you can put them together, technically you can make rocks. I cannot believe that ice is a rock. I know. Mine's blown. <laughs> I'm curious, I found this in my collection and I'm wondering, I was trying to think about what I thought this particular uh, rocky thing is if it would be sedimentary, metamorphic, igneous, or something else entirely. Um, do y'all see what's going on here? This is like a little bookend that I have. Mm -hmm. What are we looking at here, guys? So this is, this is a certain category of sedimentary rocks that is a little bit harder than just elementary. Um, <laughs> that's what we call a, a chemical sedimentary rock. So there's a flavor of rocks that are similar to say salt that are suspended in the ocean, right? If you picked up ocean water, you knew it was salty if you licked it, but you wouldn't see the salt crystals. But if you evaporated it down, the crystals would start to crystallize out of the water. Same thing's happening for that rock. You had a, a really silica rich water that was moving through and hit a cavity in that, in that environment and it made a chemical sedimentary rock. So it got it, as it hit the cavity, the decrease in pressure probably made a, a lot of the silica sort of precipitate out. That's the geologist term. Yeah, in Santa Cruz, we have a lot of hard water, right? So we're often concerned about like that crust growing inside of our, of, of the pipes of our homes and things like that. That's also, a, it's, that's as good as a chemical sedimentary rock as well. Um, it's not silica like that uh, thing you're holding is made of, but it's a similar sort of process where things are just coming out of the water and forming crusts and salts and things like that. I don't know if I would have uh, said sedimentary with this. So that's, that's very interesting. Um, okay, we also did get one submission this week that may or may not have been for y'all. The museum gets questions about things that people find um, quite frequently, but we thought we'd share it with you anyways. So I'm gonna um, pull it up and share this submission. So this, we did not receive any information to go along with it. So this is quite the mystery um, for you all to solve. <laughs> um, but I've got a couple of pictures here for you to review. Do you think we're looking at a rock here? Can you figure out what kind of rock we're looking at here? What do you see? Mm -hmm. Ooh, so there's this interesting texture on the top of it, right? And so, you know, what the outside of a, a rock looks like can be a factor of many things. It can be, you know, telltale of what's inside or how, it for, how it's been, you know, tumbled around on the surface of the earth. But that is a texture and I'm, that's, that looks suspiciously tooth-like, wouldn't you say, Gavin? I would say yes. So the, the geology gents often say that uh, pa uh, paleontology is not really our strong point. So we're not good with fossils, but this looks biologic to me. And the reason I say that is just because you don't really see textures like Graham was describing on the top and sides of that often in a rock. And when you do, it's either a sort of solidified tooth or a coral maybe. So my guess would be a tooth or a coral, but, I, but the most I would probably be comfortable saying is that it's, it's probably biologic and it has been replaced, it could have been replaced by rocks as it was sitting on the surface of the earth. Would you agree, yeah. Graham? So shapes and textures like that don't usually form without the intervention of, of some critter, whether they're growing it or it's them, you know, growing themselves in the case of a coral. Right. Yeah. Do you have a, a scoop on this, Marisa? Oh, well, we did uh, reach out to a paleontologist friend um, of ours who uh, confirmed that it is indeed a fossil. 
So not a straight up rock. Uh, and it um, appears to be a mammoth tooth that um, seems a little bit small was another thing that we noticed about it, a little short. Um, and the reason for that it is likely a broken mammoth tooth. Um, and that mammoth uh, fossils are found in North America. They're all from the Pleistocene um, age. So this is probably a Pleistocene mammoth, but it could be different species. And we need to know a little bit more about where the, this was found in order to dig a little bit deeper to solve this particular case. But we, we are on it, we are closer. Um, yeah. So thanks for sharing your perspective on why you are sure that this is not uh, a rock. Um, and I think that is a good place for us to end it this week. Um, and the case continues next week as we dig into igneous rocks. All right. Well, thanks again, gents. Thanks to everyone watching. We'll see you next week.